Hey, this is Christian Buckley in another Collab Talk podcast and vlog, and I'm here with Charlie Hall and Martin White. We're talking about, well, a few different topics around search and kind of the state of enterprise search. It's a fascinating topic. I think that there's a lot to go in and, and kind of uh, you know, unravel about where things are, uh, and I'll, you know, we'll, we'll just jump right into it. And uh, Charlie, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Charlie Hull. Uh, I've been working with search engines for around 20 years now. I founded a business called Flax, and uh, very recently that's merged with our American partners, Open Source Connections, where I'm now a senior managing consultant and running the UK arm. And I'm the co-author of the book Searching the Enterprise with Professor Uda Krushwitz, and I also run search meetups and speak at conferences and write uh, all kinds of things about search. And also, as we just discussed at the beginning, as we were getting underway, is that he's also a huge sci-fi fan. So it's just like, well, we may, uh, you know, venture into that at the very end here if we've got time. But uh, yeah. Uh, and, and then Martin. Right. I've been doing search since 1975. In the early days of using remote access to the big shared databases run by Lockheed and SDC. Um, started writing some software in 1980. But it really got into it when I set up Intranet Focus in 1999, because I very quickly found, as a consultant on an Intranet project, that most of the time search sucked. <laughs> no one quite knew how it sucked or why it was bad. And so almost every project I've done since 1999, somehow search has gone into it, because it's a search and a browse and a five. The whole thing is related. I've written, there are five books on enterprise search, and I've written four of them. Charlie's written, and Uda have written the other one. Um, and most of my work nowadays is with multinational companies who cannot find stuff that they have written. And this stuff may be in a pharma company 10, 15 years ago. It is as bad now as it was 15 years ago because they've got a problem with a drug and they need to work out what happened in research. So it's not just about can I find this news item today? Is can I find this, this research report from 15 years ago, which if I can't, a lawyer is going to make a mess of us in a court. You know, so my, my entry point into uh, intranets and really the, this, the search issue, and I, I go back into the, the early 90s when I kind of got into the space and I was uh, working for a company in California, a con consulting company out of uh, Texas, um, and I was going in and moving. They had paper-based documentation that was literally in a storage unit. If I would go and update documentation to one of our programs uh, for the state of California, I would have to uh, schedule time, drive across town, make an appointment to go and swap out pages in binders in boxes that they would bring in you know, on, on a forklift to, uh, uh, for me to, to kind of swap things out. One of my first projects was digitizing all of that content and moving across, validating all of it. And then slowly as we did that and had the backups, uh, it would go in and retire the paper-based uh, you know, media and did that for a, for a couple of years. But then I went in and I went to work for the phone company um, in our intranet. It was what I was finding and building out a project management organization for them was, uh, you know, trying to make it easier for people to access the standardized documentation around our methodology, as well as all of the, the assets that were created on past and present and future projects. And so I got a lesson in how difficult it was, you know, if you didn't know exactly where it was in which silo and which server it was sitting to ever see it again. And so I was, you know, getting creative when I, you know, again, I was unlearned in intranets and a, a lot of this, the search techniques. And I was building, funny enough, with, with Corel Draw, I was drawing these process flows with hyperlinks to these libraries. Uh, and so I was essentially classifying this content and trying to make it easier to go and locate these things. And I was, you know, so that was my entry point and that was around 95, 96. Well, but to be honest, things haven't changed a great deal. I mean, Martin brings up a great point about historical information. Um, and something I, I said years ago is uh, one of the huge confusions we have is people confuse enterprise search with web search. Um, web search is, a, is, in a way, a, an easier job because you're looking for generally recent, popular, well-linked information, whereas enterprise information is often 
a bit like that thing in uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where it's, it's locked in a filing cabinet in a cupboard under the stairs with a, a sign on the door saying, beware of a leopard. And the, the, item, the item you're looking for may never have been searched for before. It may never have been found before, but it's really pertinent to your, your current challenge. And so all those concepts that are so useful in web search, like you know, hyperlinks and popularity and, and page rank and this kind of thing that people think uh, you know, Google's, Google's great at that, just aren't so useful in enterprise search. You're, you're, you're often always, you know, you're, you're dealing in the long tail, you're dealing with rare queries, you're dealing with rare documents. Right. And I, I, I have a, a current client actually in the medical space and they built a, a great big search engine with a very modern open source um, piece of software and it's fantastic. What it's actually doing is helping them find the physical location of paper medical records. And they're not going to digitize all those records. What they need is the latest information on a particular patient. But the stuff that was 30 years ago, the stuff that was scribbled down by a doctor on a yellowing piece of paper, still exists in a filing cabinet somewhere. And all the search engine actually does is help index that and discover where it's physically located. They're still going to have to go back to the paper. In organizations, this information takes decades to change, mature, be scanned, updated, digitized, whatever. And so again, I think we're, we're, we're dealing with a very old problem of information access here, and search, can, search is only part of the picture sometimes. And if I can just pick up from that, Christian, because when you look at the research that's being done on web search, there's a huge discipline, largely called information retrieval, and there are tens of thousands of papers because there's a real commercial intent behind the academics that, hey, I can go and work for Google or Bing or wherever. So there's a huge amount of research. It's only really over the last couple of years, for the first time, have we begun to understand how people search inside the enterprise. So all the assumptions being made on this cognitive and insight software, it may work where you've got the links and the volumes of data around people using the same content time and time again. But actually, inside a company, the view that people sit there all day long doing nothing but search is so far away from the truth. Because you may phone a friend, send an email, look on your bookshelf, ask someone. There are so many ways of finding information, and search is just one of those. It's not the way, and we have to do it because people are using it all day long. Well, that, and that's one of the issues, too, is that it, it's, uh, look, in the late 90s, I get involved with this was a startup I was a co-founder of in uh, looking at pattern recognition. And part of it was we weren't trying to solve the search issue. We were looking at something completely different. But what, we, you know, what I learned about from having that experience in the intranet portal world uh, was that exactly that point is that um, I might be looking for something that I have no idea uh, it's 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 most likely not being classified the right way. The proper metadata assigned, I might or might not have the right access to that, but I but I should. Um, but it's I, I want data that I don't know to look for and and where to look for that. And 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 so it, it's uh, with the pattern recognition you know, are the uh, concepts we had uh, we were developing were that it would you know, the system would start to become more intelligent and go and understand the context of what you were asking for and then bring up results that you may not have been asking for or may not have been classified. I mean, I, I look, this is an important lesson where, you know, if you've ever gone and searched for something and you're not sure that you're the right phrasing, it's not your area of expertise and you're using the wrong words, you may never find the things which you are one step away from because of that. You're using you're using words like understand and uh, here and uh, you know expecting a computer to understand something is is somewhat of a leap in my in my mind and again this is the problem we have at the moment um, you know computers are generally stupid machines that work very fast um, you can simulate something that might look like it understands what you're asking but frankly it doesn't it doesn't read English it doesn't speak English it doesn't know that a word is associated with a, a, you know, a vague concept somewhere. Um, and w one can try, but again, it comes back to some of the same basic problems, which is, you know, that it's, it, it, it's around, you know, badly, badly filed, badly organized, badly tagged information, and doing our best to sort that out, um, where the, the, the user very often gives us very little to work with. You know, if we can't get the user to explain what they meant by their question, 
then we're we're in, we're in a very difficult place, and no amount of uh, of clever software is going to save you. Which, which led to, I think, I, I believe, a, a mistake in thinking that we were moving the right direction with with search is around the social patterns, and and the problem was by by. Uh, uh, by focusing on content or, or uh, having it rise to the, you know, the, 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 the first page of results based on what my network is doing. Well, I might be, you know, networking with a bunch of idiots, you know, who, who are, uh, you know, gamers and, and other things where, uh, you know, who knows, you know, what crazy things they're searching for and clicking on that may be completely irrelevant. And I never, as you said, you know, never touch on that long tail of content that I really need access to. And so there, there was this move a couple years ago, uh, in, and again, my perspective, um, to become more reliant on, you know, the, the social results and, and how that, uh, you know, impacted as a way of solving some of that, that problem. Okay. Uh, I mean, Christian, you must have been in Macy's in, in New York. I'm sorry, where? Macy's, the department store? Oh, I've, I've been to a Macy's, yes. Right, okay. If you walk in there and say, where's their birthday present department, they'll tell you, we haven't got a birthday, best birthday present department. Why are you asking for it? Because I want to buy a birthday present for my son. Oh, how old's your son? Oh, he's 17 and he's, in, he's into soccer. Oh, right, well, if you go up into the sports area, we've got some great discounts on sports clothing and you can buy a Master United shirt and stuff like this. What I'm illustrating is an interaction and search is all about someone interacting with the software. This doesn't happen when you do a SQL query in SAP. And the search engine is responding because once you start to give it some information, okay, son, aged 18, the, the engine to some extent can start thinking, okay, he's not interested in holidays on the Riviera or however it's tagged or, or indexed. And I think we keep on forgetting this, not this, at the, end of a, at the end of the query, we have to deliver the best reference at the top. No, we have to have, build an engine that progressively, as Charlie was saying, doesn't learn, but it starts to filter out the stuff that is perhaps getting in the way and focusing down on what we're asking. It's about interactions. And there's a brilliant piece by Daniel Tunkalan that he published a couple of days ago in Medium that you should refer your, your readers to because it's all about understanding the human computer interaction. And that's yeah. critically important in refining search. Yeah, that, that process of gradual refinement is absolutely essential. And, and this initiation of a conversation um, between the, you know, the user and the machine. Um, I'd like to say though that the, again, we come back to the problem with, with applying sort of social models to enterprises that in a, way, in a lot of organizations, the, the, this idea of sharing, tagging, organizing the information that you produce or, or, or are related to is, is, is kind of anathema to how some people work. People sometimes quite like their silos and they don't want people to come to talk to them. Um, I was talking to somebody uh, at, in uh, Copenhagen last week at a conference, or two weeks ago, and there was, they were building a people search for a very large pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. Uh, the problem is he's slightly terrified about what his users will do when they find out they've been tagged as being related to this set of documents, because sub su suddenly someone in the back room somewhere becomes the de facto expert on a particular subject area. And everyone's going to be calling him up and emailing him saying, you know, you know all about this kind of thing, don't you? Well, well, how do you think that? Well, because this search engine told me, because you're linked to all of these documents. And, and it may be that they've just been asking questions in entirely chat, possible. depending on what signals are feeding into that engine, right? Yeah. Yeah, but without, and, and I, I mean, without understanding of some of these things about how you know, organizations work, and I think Martin, Martin's uh, probably far hot, hotter on this stuff than I am, but uh, without understanding how organizations actually work, uh, again, we, we make these assumptions that, that software will, will help. And it's actually, solving search is not just a software issue, it's, a, it's an organizational issue as much as anything else. It's a people issue. Um, and again, it doesn't matter how many buzzwords you put in your, your shiny new search engine. If, if you haven't understood that, if you hadn't understood the nature of people trying to find information, then you're missing a trick. Christian, have you ever come across the org, org chart from Autodesk? Uh, not from Autodesk, no. Okay, Autodesk between 2007 and 2012, what they did was they mapped the relationship between employees and their managers and who came in and who left. It's a five minute video on the web. 
Hmm. And what you see is over these five years is that the patterns have changed. The number of times networks are rebuilt inside Autodesk is absolutely amazing. And how on earth are you going to build a search solution which remembers what your network was two years ago in order to find the stuff that you think you might need? And you only have to look at that video to realize anything that is based on remembering what people around you have written is bound to fail because those networks, particularly in our organizations, get broken very quickly as we reorganize. People come new into the organization. People leave. How is all that going to be incorporated in the in the social element of enterprise search? Well, it's one of the reasons why. I, I, when again, this was the late '90s. Uh, we sold our company in January 2001, um, but we were focused on the pattern recognition, which was to look past what was happening today and say, just looking at what where have we seen uh, you know, a similar pattern? Again, we weren't trying to solve the search problem. Um, we were actually looking at project management systems and. And as people are inputting uh, requirements into the system, that it's it, it, as you enter more and more information, it's saying, you know, there's this project that happened two years ago um, in New York City that was uh, a 60% match to what you've put in. You put in more info. It was you're not 85% of a match, and it's not a it's not a search for that thing. But then would you know basically build this uh, you know this this rich web of connections with these other assets. And when you go and acknowledge that, hey, yeah, this is something very similar, you could then reuse artifacts from that other project and in theory, speed up the delivery time of your project. That's what we were trying to solve. But it was similar to this where, uh, you know, we hear all these catchphrases about, you know, artificial intelligence, AI now for, for search, um, the, the uh, you know, neural networks and uh, cognitive services, kind of all these things which will make search easier. Uh, what, is, what do these things actually mean? What, what is actually happening with modern well, search? Uh, there is certainly advances in, in, in some areas. Um, I mean, if you look under the very wide and extending AI umbrella, um, as, as I think I said previously, AI is being extended to cover many things that are quite old concepts actually have been about for a long time. There are some areas in the machine learning space which, which are interesting. Uh, there's a, a powerful technique that came out of some research. Um, I think originally I saw this at uh, Microsoft Research um, a good 15 years ago now. And it's a technique called learning to rank. And what this does effectively is it does a search as before and brings back, say, a thousand results. And then it uses a machine learning system to reshuffle those results based, based on a set of signals. So it learns. For example, you might say, I want very simplicity. I want the pr products that make our company the most money. I want them to come near the top of the list. So uh, you feed in various signals about you know, how much money you make, you know, uh, number of sales, dollar value, whatever. And the model, the machine learning model, effectively learns you know, what, what, what it should rank at the top. So th this is a, a technique that, uh, again, it's, it's not, not a particularly new technique, but it's quite a powerful way of giving people more relevant results and if you can get your and the, the trouble is it's quite hard to do you need reliable signals you need a model that you understand you need people to run that model who are you know you need data scientists to feed in the data you need people to understand machine learning which is a, a rare skill um and and you need a lot of luck uh, to, to get this to work but there are companies such as bloomberg who who use uh, an open source engine called solar and the learn to rank plugin they develop themselves and then donated to the, to the community to all their, for all their, uh, their news ranking. And um, my current employer's Open Source Connections work with the Wikimedia Foundation to develop a similar plugin for the Elasticsearch engine. So this is something that does actually exist. It's being used by real companies. You know, Wikipedia, uh, the Wikimedia Foundation are connected with uh, Bloomberg, you know, very big organization. And it, they're using machine learning techniques to, to make search better. But it's hard. And I've seen, I've also heard a lot of stories of people trying to do this and failing. Um, partly because it's, a, it's still a very new domain. Um, so there are things you can do in search that, you know, in, in under this, this AI umbrella uh, that, could, that could bear fruit if you, if you get your, your, all your things lined up. The problem is um, what we're seeing is people now, uh, a lot of the AI branding and, and, and buzzwords are, are just you know, purely marketing. It don't really mean anything under the hood. 
So, and the trouble is a lot of the, the big analyst companies go along with this and are happy to amplify this message. Um, so you'll see on your magic quadrants or your waves, all this kind of stuff from the big search companies. Um, and I think that, and this is something that, that Martin and I and some others have tried to counter. We, we actually set up a thing called the Search Network, which is a, a group of independent search consultants, none of which work for very big companies. Um, and we put, to get, put together independent reports on, on the state of search. So if your, your listeners are interested, just uh, Google for the Search Network or we'll pass on a link or something. Um, and hopefully we'll cut through some of the, the AI buzzwords and give you the real picture. So I think it, my answer is you know, two part there. I think that there are some interesting areas of research where you can make a serious difference with some of these more advanced uh, learning technologies that are under the umbrella of AI. But also there is a huge amount of buzzword and marketing uh, fluff out there that you have to fight your way through. Yeah, but, and the, but Christian, I think this then comes into the fact, issue that search is so often owned by IT, managed out of the IT budget by someone whose job is to make sure the servers tick over. And as far as IT is concerned, is that so long as when you do a search, it comes back and gives you a result, and for some reason you're still on Charlie and not on me, I can't work out why that is, um, is that th it works. And you really do need this team that starts to pull together people who've got the business know-how or understand business processes, who understand what the words mean. Um, hospitals are a great example because you've got the renal language and the kidney language. So you've got to work out whether the document on kidneys is relevant to renal. And language is a big issue. So the ho this whole area needs people to uh, search team skills, which are very difficult to grab hold of. They, they really don't exist. Right. Well, you, that's why you have uh, you know, events that are focused you know, heavily on this, this topic. <coughs> Um, there, there, uh, you know, there's a lot of like library sciences, uh, people. In fact, the, the first couple, uh, events that I went and presented at being a, you know, SharePoint expert coming in and talking about, um, you know, mostly, you know, search related topics. I was in DC, this was back in 2010, 2011. Um, and, and the majority of those people were like masters and PhDs in library sciences because, you know that that, that this was their skill set to go in and talk about um, classification, information architecture, and kind of the the fundamentals that no matter what technology you're putting up on top to surface those things, these are the the fundamentals that still need to be in place with any certainly within the enterprise. I mean, the, yeah, the, the work you get the, way. The, the, the 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 tax the library science people and the taxonomists and whatever um, it, it, simplistically. I think they, they come from the angle that if you get everything put in the right boxes, the right labels on the boxes, then you'll never need a search engine. You'll just be able to navigate and you'll be able to find what you're looking for. The search people say, oh, no, 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 our magic search engine, uh, you won't need any of that stuff. You don't need to put anything in boxes. It'll just figure out what boxes they land in and do it all for you. And obviously, the, the actual solution is somewhere in between. But uh, right. I think to come back to Martin's point, what we need is a way of, of convincing people that to build effective search, you need an effective search team. And that is a multi-skilled thing. That's a, you need those library science skills. You need the information retrieval skills. You need management skills. You need uh, the, the, the pure tech. You need buy-in from the, the business itself to understand. You know, the, so in fact, the technical people can understand what the search is for because it's always supporting some kind of business objective. And uh, it's very difficult to build these teams. And most organisations, as uh, Martin has been saying for many years. Most organizations totally fail to invest in effective search teams. And you'll see even global companies with effectively you know, a third of a person um, in charge of the whole search engine, um, which is crazy because considering quite how many employees will, will be relying on it day to day. Well, there's, one element, there's one element here, Charlie, I've had to spill on that because yeah. what often f people forget is we're going to buy a new search engine though they don't actually know because they've got no analytics on the old one. But more importantly is that most of the search vendors, and it goes to Microsoft, sell a product, they don't do the integration. The integration is usually done by another team um, who either have specialisms in search or are just the in-house integrator. And they come in and make it work. 
And that, again, from IT's point of view, is, oh, it's been done. We've had the integrators and it works. Actually, that's when it starts to go wrong because the minute you do your first search, you know the ranking model is 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 wrong. Well, and, and to kind of prove that out too, I think that there was, uh, so I was at Microsoft when they acquired Fast Search. And so initially, being on the SharePoint side of the house is that, uh, and, and with Office 365 at the beginning of that, um, that you know the Fast Search was still sold as an additional server product. So you went and bought SharePoint, and then you bought Fast Search. And there was the consulting and everything that was around that. And so I would you'd argue those organizations that understood the importance of that and would go and build that out took it a bit more seriously. And to to some degree, I'm not again. I'm just generalizing uh, you know, around the the technology. But when it was fully integrated in, then eyes were off the ball. You know, people say, well, it's all integrated in. It just magically works. It's just there. And that was certainly true. The out-of-the-box SharePoint search experience improved. And this was the 2010 era and then into 2013, got a little bit better. But then everyone started to stop talking about search uh, as if it was now solved, it was, you know. Well, I mean, SharePoint search pre the fast acquisition was generally known to be uh, pretty bad. Um, and it's debatable whether, I mean, I think my view would be, you know, Microsoft bought fast to buy in that expertise. Um, I don't think any code sort of was literally sort of copied out of one repository and into, into um, SharePoint. Uh, it was a, ma a matter of getting the right people, getting the right expertise in. And, and the, the actual transition was quite painful, especially for some of the past fast customers who all promised that their old search engine would happily run on Linux forever, which uh, a lot of us could see was never going to be the case. Um, but yes, uh, it, it feeds into a, another narrative, which is this, this kind of fire and forget approach to search, and, that, and that's never healthy. Uh, search is a constant process. You, you are, you're going to constantly have to be tweaking and adjusting and measuring search. Um, and again, this, this comes back to building an effective team. You can't just drop it in and, and hope it works. In fact, it's very common for people to buy a new search engine to fix all the problems with the old search engine that everyone hates, uh, drop it in, turn it on with all the defaults, and it's worse than the old search engine, because at least the old one was tuned to some degree. Um, so yeah, you're, as Martin says, you're right at the beginning of your journey when you install that new search engine, and you're gonna, you're gonna look at a constant process of tuning and improvement. Uh, even so, something as simple as, you know, language uh, changes, even in English, you know, we have new words invented every single year. Uh, you know, they have these things about, you know, what new words have gone in the dictionary this year. And if you were searching for those words five years ago, you wouldn't find anything. Yeah. So somehow you've got to keep up with the, the way language changes, the way uses changes, the way pe new people, employees come into your organization and expect different things. Um, I always say that, uh, you know, some, a young person going to work for a large corporate, and going from the hyper-connected world of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram into an organization which is probably still using the same enterprise tools they were using 20 years ago um, is going to get a bit of a shock, quite how hard it is to find anything. Um, so yeah, the, the, this, you're going to need a, a constant process of improvement. And I think, uh, I don't know a lot about the SharePoint world, but it sounds to me like uh, that they've fallen back into that old trap of saying, just drop it in, it'll work, work by magic, you'll never need to touch it again. Yeah, I, there's there's a bit of that, and 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 I think that the in the problems we're discussing, it's you know, again not to to get into one specific uh, you know technology area of like you know SharePoint, but um, I, I think it's just indicative of of the cycle that we see in IT where we have this over reliance on the technology, and then there's the real world learning that happens, and everything kind of goes back, and uh, you know the more thoughtful. Uh, you know, processes applied to to solve the problem, and then we get new technology comes out. I think that's, again, my perspective. I think that's where we are with AI and cognitive services, and, and, and it, you know, all this this talk. Of course, I work primarily within the Microsoft ecosystem, so there's all this talk that that's out there, and I think this over reliance on the technology to go and solve this, and I again is off the ball of what actually has to happen to have that healthy enterprise search experience. Uh, well, I think one of, the, one of the tech changes we haven't talked about in its general is we've gone from on-prem to cloud. Mm. Everyone is doing cloud. What often happens then is you lose control over the crawl. 
because it's optimized by the cloud vendor because they don't want to have, you know, they are basically trying to keep as smooth as possible amount of resource being used. But what that means is that you haven't got that ability to, let me just go and re-index that little bit because there'll be some changes there. We've done a metadata, metadata update. You can't do that because you don't control the crawl anymore. And I think this is a, we've not really explored, I think, as a community, to what extent cloud is helpful in search and cloud isn't helpful in search. Because the sense of, look at all this stuff that's coming, and it's not just Microsoft. You know, Google have gone cloud-based, this new enterprise search in the cloud. And we can update this instantly. Well, you may be able to update the code instantly, but the people inside the organization are now struggling, A, to work out what the implications are, and what happens about all the stuff we've already indexed? Oh, I've got, I've got 120 million documents. You've changed that particular little bit of code. Are you going to go back and re-index all 120 million documents for me? Well, that's actually one. So I've only run into a couple companies that have thought about that. It was in their reasoning. So research that I've done around uh, hybrid environments is that that was one of the primary reasons for remaining in a hybrid model and controlling that indexing prop, the mm -hmm. process and on the, those systems. And so their portal, yeah, that, that aspect of it, they had more control of it and they were just accessing these cloud-based systems. So, uh, you know, pulling data out as, as needed, but that the majority of in their archives were controlled through that on-prem environment still. Yeah. And yet that hybrid model, is now starting, oh no, that's old hat. Um, because it makes it difficult for the cloud vendor because then sinking back into the on-prem is a bit of a nightmare for them. And they don't like nightmares, they just want regular income. Right, well, it's, they're, they're, look, this, and that's a completely different discussion of, of what's happening with hybrid. Because I, I think, again, the, from the Microsoft ecosystem, I think um, the scale of, of hybrid of the number of, of organizations that would push back on being pure cloud. Well, it's certainly for the SMB, the small mid-sized mid company, uh, and those that were new just starting out, it didn't make sense to kind of go backwards in technology and do on-premises deployments. Um, but the scale of those of existing customers wanting to keep you know, a footprint on-prem um, took them by surprise. And the I mean, reality is that a large majority of organizations in the SharePoint world are hybrid, are not pure cloud. Um, but we've now got, I'm, sure, I'm sure Charlie can talk to this, but we've now got this new sort of competitive environment in which you've got Microsoft increasingly moving towards Azure, which is based on Elasticsearch. And you've now got AWS saying, oh, by the way, we'll have a bit of that and we'll stick Elastic in. So all of a sudden, the open source community has now got these two big cloud vendors that, are, you know, and Charlie, I'm sure, can pick up and, and give us perspective on really, what is really quite an important development in open source. Yes, the, um, what's happening at the moment is, I mean, yeah, I, I, I can see the, the advantages of people looking at a, a cloud-hosted search, but... Um, if we look you know, slightly outside the, the, the SharePoint world, um, although you know, there are plenty of people using SharePoint who, who take advantage of this, if you're not relying just on Microsoft search technology, you've got many other options. Um, and people are beginning to seriously consider these for, um, for enterprise search because I think a lot of that, that kind of fear that if you're doing things in the cloud, it's all insecure and somehow Amazon can see your data, uh, it, it is, it's that, that fear is receding. Um, but what, what we're seeing is some, some interesting sort of land grabs going on. Uh, there are two major open source search engines out there. There's uh, Apache Lucene Solar and there's Elasticsearch. And one is Apache Solar is, is an open source, pure open source project. There's no one company controlling it. It's under the Apache umbrella and used by, you know, huge amounts of organizations. And yeah, you can, you can go out and find cloud hosted, solar powered uh, enterprise search and search engines. Plenty of vendors produce those, plenty of people uh, allow them. But um, in the other world, the Elasticsearch world, uh, it's an open source project, but actually controlled by a single company, Elastic, who went, who went public actually last year to great fanfare. Um, they are currently engaged in quite an interesting battle with Amazon. Now, Amazon 
have recently produced hosted versions of services based on open source projects. So if you want to run a database in the cloud, Amazon will give you a database in the cloud, running an AWS, if you want to run a search engine in the cloud, they'll give you Elasticsearch in the cloud. But this is something Elastic do as well. So there's a competitive thing going on here. And Elastic, uh, uh, like some other companies, are attempting to fight off the Amazon gorilla by changing the licensing terms of their open source software, debatably not making it as open sourcey as it was. So what we're seeing is people saying, well, if we want to, if you want to run this, this search software in the cloud, you're now, you've now got several options, but there are people trying to protect their, their business by fiddling with license terms and forking the software and producing different versions of the software for different use, uses. Um, and I, I believe um, Elastic's public share price dropped by 5% in the last week. So there's serious money to be lost or made in these, in these debates. And when we see these giant vendors like Amazon, uh, you know, a very, very big company with huge amounts of you know, very deep pockets, being able to change the way that uh, people think about buying search or, or databases or whatever by providing these hosted services and um, actually flexing their muscles to pull control away from some of the companies that are, are centralized around these, this software. I think it's very interesting times indeed. The good thing, of course, is it's all open source. So this code is all available to everyone and actually it widens the community. The thing about open source software is putting more open source software into the mix increases choice. So for end users, that's potentially a good thing. Um, but it's an, interesting, it's an interesting world out there at the moment. There's certainly been a, a, a flood of blog posts over the last, last week. Uh, are Amazon the bad guys? Are Elastic the bad guys? Who's the, are, is there any good guy in this? What's going on? But uh, it's not quite as simple uh, out in the, the wild west of open source as it is in, in Microsoft land where if you've got SharePoint, you've kind of got search already. Well, and maybe in the last few minutes we have here, uh, Charlie, a couple of times you've, you've gone back to you know, the importance of the team that you have in place to go and, and manage this. And that, again, that is something that, you know, I, I've been in IT now for close to 30 years. And so not long enough to see the cycles around the new technology and then buffering this with, with people and the experience to cutting those people loose, buying some new technology that'll do it all, learning from that, again, building up the team and expertise around that. So for organizations, uh, you know, it's, I think it's a different thing. When you're talking about a company that has 50, you know, 80,000 employees and deeper pockets to go and be able to solve things, for the majority of organizations that are more in that, um, that, that are, trying to solve the search. Obviously there are small companies that might have less than a hundred employees where search is critical to their business. But really when you're talking about, it's kind of in that mid tier of the 500 to 5,000 realm, but what kind of a team you go and talk to a, a potential client um, about this and you're giving them recommendations on, you know, how to build up this team and how they should focus on this for that ongoing operations of search, not just the initial deployment of new technology. What are yeah. your recommendations? What, what should companies be thinking about? Well, I think we very often do this. In fact, you know, uh, my, my, uh, my, uh, I should, I should say besides hiring Charlie and Martin to come in <laughs> and talk to you. Well, of because, course, that should yeah. be your first port of call. Of course. Um, but no, uh, what I would say is, I mean, uh, Open Source Connections, who I'm working for now, actually our whole mission is about empowering other people's teams. You know, we're not, we're not in the business of going in and doing the job for you. We really want to bring your team up the, you know, up the scale and, and improve how you do search. So very often we're, we're, we, we, we tell people uh, several things. Firstly, this has to be cross-disciplinary. It's got to have management support. You've got to look for a collaboration between the business and the technical sides. Um, and really get everyone in the room, even if you have to sit down some people who really don't understand what a search engine even is and explain to them how it works and why what the content they produce is important. Um, but uh, we're also looking at more specialized things. We're, we've actually been developing uh, a role uh, that we call a, a relevance engineer. So relevance is about you know, getting the right things at the top of those search results to be on your query. And um, it's one, only one of the aspects of producing good search. You know, you've got to have it working fast and, and not falling over every five minutes. And uh, you've got to have- The, the uh, traditional IT stuff, use. I think is- Yeah, the traditional know. stuff. Right. You've also got to have a good user interface, but in terms of just getting the right things in the right order. Um, so this idea of a relevance engineer, this is somebody who can 
cover both the tech aspects and the business aspects. So they know a bit about uh, why people would be more interested in this result and that result in an, say, an e-commerce situation or an internal company situation. They understand some of the business drivers, but they also understand a bit about how we actually make search engines do that. So they understand a bit about information retrieval theory. They know how to implement this in particular search engines. And so one of the things I've been involved with recently is a conference we set up, set up called Haystack. Um, and we're running the second US one in a few weeks now in April in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. Um, and it's, to be honest, if you want to come to that, you better get your tickets quick because it's selling very quickly. Um, the one last year was one of the best conferences I've ever been to. Um, not only, I, I, I had the lovely experience of not having to explain to people that what I did for a living was a bit like Google, but not really. Um, and I was so impressed, I actually brought it to the UK and we ran a, a, a London version of the conference in October last year. But what that's all about, basically this whole question of relevance and relevance engineering uh, as a discipline in itself. You know, what does relevance to me mean from both a business and technical perspective? How do we achieve it? How do we measure it? How do you know how good your search engine is? Because if you don't have that baseline, how can you try and improve? How do you continuously iterate to improve search? And we're trying to develop this in a totally te you know, technology agnostic way, um, a way to really advance the debate around relevance. And if you're interested, there's a bit more written in the Search Insights report that came out uh, this week that we can point your, your uh, listeners to. So you're able to let people go out and, and, and look at their baseline, their, uh, their search success against you know, other similar companies in their industry? Well, measure against, you know, you, you can measure it against, you know, com your competitors, you can measure it against, you know, you've got to define what do you think good search is? If you don't know what good search is, then how can you ever improve? If you haven't ever asked, gone out and asked your users, do they like search or hate search? If you've never actually sat down some clients and said, right, you show me how you do a search for that thing we're meant to be providing for you, then, then how on earth do you, know, do you know if it's any good? How do you know if that six, seven bigger investment you made on the new search engine has been worth it or not. No, or even if it, is it, is it worth moving? Is it worth migrating? Have you squeezed the juice out of the last things you could tweak on your old search engine? But until people start getting this culture of measurement uh, into their heads somehow, um, we're never going to know how good search is or how to improve it. And that, that's certainly something we're, we're very keen to push. And I'd, I'd build on that question from Charlie because I think I come at it from a different way I'm an information scientist and when I go into companies I'm interested in do they see information as an asset who owns that information who's responsible for quality who does training in terms of how to write even good reports and title PowerPoint slides and things like this because it comes back to something we're talking about right at the very beginning you've got a PowerPoint presentation that says next stop the rising sun and, and is that to the nearest pub, the nearest cafe? Is it the search strategy for Japan? Is it, you know, Elon Musk talking about his next space venture? How can a search engine pull that out if all you've got to go on is those clever titles you give to your Excel spreadsheets or anything? So my key thing is it's about information management. Search is part of a bigger issue. And if you don't manage your information, it doesn't matter what technology you buy, in the end, there's one thing you know about a good search engine, it will find rubbish even more quickly than the bad search engine you had just a month ago. I always love that the, uh, you know, when you know search is working, when people uh, freak out because suddenly content that shouldn't be visible surfaced by some different employees, you know, so they're like, they shouldn't be seeing this. It's like, well, the search is broken. Like, well, no, actually what you're seeing is search is working now and you've not properly protected that, that, that content. Um, There's nothing like a search engine for finding holes in your security. And it's, <laughs> a, it, it's a good exercise, actually, when people install enterprise searches to come up with a little like, list of um, things that might reveal stuff that you don't want people to see. You know, your boss's salary or the fact that, seriously, that, that, that office across the, uh, across the road is being closed next week and we're looking for a new building. What does that mean? So in, even in terms of there's information out there but, but people may never have been able to find this information or access it because the search engine that didn't exist or was very bad in the past. But yes, it, it's a common problem. Um, but yes, you're right. Um, it's very much a garbage in, garbage out problem as well. Um, so I, I think what we need to do, as Martin says, is look at the whole landscape. This is enterprise search sits within a, a landscape of other things. Um, and we've got to take account of all of those things to improve the search experience for users. 
You know, I think we could talk for an hour just on that topic of cleaning up content because it's, uh, I mean, what we've seen, again, my anecdotal experience of this is that, you know, organizations are, you know, fearful of throwing away anything, you know, any content because they, they, they understand that, you know, prior practices of just putting a life cycle on content without really understanding what is there and what should be kept. Um, legal may have a perspective, but, you know, in the, in the information management side of that, you know, people just are, are, are slow to delete, to, uh, you know, to, to uh, get rid of, of content. What's, what's happens. I mean, just like, like life that happens is that the further you get away from a project that uh, you weren't sure what wouldn't, what needs to happen with the life cycle of the content of the assets that were created within that body. So they sit, they're just on some server, they're in some folder somewhere on whatever system, whatever multiple applications and services that you're using, you forget about that, which then could become a, some kind of security risk or, or, or just slow down the search process later by, bulking up your, your system with content that's no longer relevant. It, so that's why, again, it's, a, it's an ongoing activity to be in there looking at this co content, consolidating, regardless of the platform. I am come from the SharePoint Office 365 world. I have my perspective on that. Um, but to constantly be relooking and cleaning up that, that content. I mean, even in my personal archives, I'm a, an avid OneNote user on, on an almost daily basis. I am purging content, consolidating things, whether it be files, tabs within, you know, OneNote, um, moving things across or deleting files or moving over to folders because now my understanding of the, the, the you know, the, the quality or the, the importance of this, um, uh, the validity of this content is, you know, needs to be now over here with this other body of, of content. But I'm so doing that proactively. Teams, um, actually, they, 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 they have really harsh policies on content. Um, uh, somebody we know at uh, some young uh, uh, talked about this years ago, where actually that you know, if stuff is old, it gets thrown away. If it's not up to date, it gets thrown away. You end up with a much better, better search experience. You've got far fewer things to look through. Um, but you, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of discipline to be that harsh about, throwing stuff away. The trouble is computers get faster, disks get bigger, we end up with more memory. Storage is so inexpensive, right, yeah. We can store yeah. a lot more, we can store 17 copies of everything if we want to, <laughs> people do. That um, first, uh, you know, that first, uh, uh, the portal that I worked on, so for back for the phone company in the mid 90s, we did this massive data center consolidation and the size of this that we were uh, moving was 1.2 terabytes. I now comment that I have a music um, external drive that's two terabytes that's underneath my desk and it's just music and uh, and it was a big deal you know back in the mid 90s it's just amazing um you know now just the, uh, the 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 numbers but well gentlemen i really appreciate your time today i know we're at the the top of the hour here but i uh, really appreciate it i mean again there's a lot to unpack a lot to talk about in this this area but uh, for people that want to find out more about either one of you what's the best way to get in touch with you guys um basically we we've got tweets and you can dm us i mean i'm internet focused that's very easy charlie uh, you can find me on Twitter as Flax Search, F L A X Search, or via my my, uh, my company at OpenSourceConnections.com. Um, yeah. But yeah, if you uh, if you Google for Enterprise Search, it won't be long before you find uh, Leo Martin writing about it somewhere. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today, and we'll talk to you soon. You're very Thanks. welcome.